All right, well, y'all can be seated. I'll go see if I can find it. No, I'm not going up. I told him I wasn't. Okay, guys, where's Mario? Where's Mario? Hello in there. Rats. Nobody sent me a Christmas card today. I almost wish there weren't a holiday season. I know nobody likes me. Why do we have to have a holiday season to emphasize it? Thanks for the Christmas card you sent me, Violet. I didn't send you a Christmas card, Charlie Brown. Don't you know sarcasm when you hear it? Pigpen, you're the only person I know who can raise a cloud of dust in a snowstorm. Get snowflakes on your tongue. It's fun. Mmm. Meat sugar. It's too early. I never eat December snowflakes. I always wait until January. They sure look ripe to me. so smart with that blanket. What are you going to do with it when you grow up? Maybe I'll make it into a sport coat. Hello in there. Rats. Nobody sent me a Christmas card today. I almost wish there weren't a holiday season. I know nobody likes me. Why do we have to have a holiday season to emphasize it? Thanks for the Christmas card you sent me, Violet. I didn't send you a Christmas card, Charlie Brown. Don't you know sarcasm when you hear it? Pigpen, you're the only person I know who can raise a cloud of dust in a snowstorm. <laughs> How many of you remember a Charlie Brown Christmas? How many of you watched it this year? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about this show and I'll talk to you about a few things that kind of came and went with this television program. I want to introduce you to the fellow who created Peanuts. Now most of you know that it was Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz was born in 1922 and by 1950 he had launched, he had launched the Peanuts comic strip. It, had, it was going national at that point. And for 50 years until 2000, February 13th of 2000, actually was the last day that his cartoon strip ran and that happened to be the day that he passed away on due to cancer. But in those 50 years this man created most of 18,000 Peanuts comic strips. He also saw those comic strips running in 2,600 different newspapers and on a daily basis there were over 350 million people reading this little comic strip. It was probably the most popular comic strip of its uh, in, during most of those 50 years. There were some others that, that, that really vibed against it, but Peanuts kind of dominated the entire comic world back in those days. Now, to give you a little bit more of an introduction on who Charles Schultz is or who he was, Charles Schultz, as I mentioned, he was born in 1922. He grew up in Minneapolis. His father and mother were so-so parents. They're, the family was not a very well organized, not a very tight family, and, and most of his years, most of his childhood years, Charles had been a pretty sickly child. He didn't have an opportunity to play with a lot of friends, to create a lot of relationships and so forth, so he ended up inside, and during those years he fell in love with art. He drew everything he could draw. The trouble was, most people did not like his art. He was constantly 
introducing his art and, and, and bringing it into competitions. And he was always being rejected. Matter of fact, in high school, after developing a lot of art for the high school yearbook, his fellow students rejected his art. He grew up with a lot of depression. Matter of fact, that little red-headed girl that you know we hear talked about in the comics that we see this little red-headed girl popping up here and there in the Peanuts comic strip, that was really a story of an unrequited love that Charles had had for a woman by the name of Donna Mae Johnson. Donna Mae Johnson had agreed to date Charles in the late 1940s. And in 1950, June 3rd of 1950, uh, Charles proposed to her, said, will you marry me? And she said no. And a couple of weeks later, she married another guy. So his life was filled with these rejections. Actually, Charles Schultz laid down organized religion in 1922. This was the year that his mother died. She died of cancer. And the, the minister at the Lutheran church that they attended sporadically had promised to come and visit her on her deathbed. But he never showed up. So this is a guy that was kind of a wash in life. He did not really know which way to go, which way to look, what to do. But he kept on working on his art. However, about six years later, 1948, Charles became reacquainted with Christ. He was baptized into Jesus and became a lifelong student of the Bible. Now, his faith walk with God de definitely had its ups and downs. But in 1965, Charles Schultz changed the world. And he changed it with that little TV program, A Charlie Brown Christmas. I want to talk to you a little bit about what went on and how this came together and what happened back in 1965. It was in the fall of the year, 1965, Coca-Cola came to the guys and girls at, at CBS New York. They said, we want to sponsor a Christmas show. Do you have something on the shelf? And of course, in at CBS, never to be a network to miss a buck, they said, yeah, we have a show ready for you to go. Well, in truth, they didn't have anything. They didn't even have anything in creative production at that point. Nothing was going on. So as quickly as that meeting was over, one of the guys at CBS who knew who Charles Schultz was called him and said, Charles, how would you like to do a Christmas program using your Peanuts characters for this year's Christmas? And Schultz said, well, tell me more about it. The guy said, well, the downside is you have to have the program ready in six weeks, which was an unbelievably short time to produce a network television program. Schultz said, okay, I'll do the deal. With one proviso, I get to do this show my way. Well, CBS didn't have much to lose. They said, go for it. So with that, Charles took his crew together, got them all together. They conceived the idea. Charles was a workaholic, and they worked night and day, night and day, on that six-week run. Finally, just a few days before air date, air date was going to be uh, December the 13th, 1965, just a few days prior to air date, Charles Schultz showed up in New York with the final, final program. When they screened it for the CBS execs, they were mortified. They were angry. They said, Charles, this is never going to go on our air. This isn't what we wanted. He said, what's wrong with it? They said, well, the voiceovers, they're amateurish. The whole thing seems morose. Your characters are all two-dimensional. We thought we were going to give dimension to these things. And besides that, the music, the background music, it's horrible. It's some kind of a jazz shuffle. It doesn't sound like Christmas to us. And Schultz said, well, our agreement was I could do it my way. This is my way. It's going to go on air this way or it's not going on air. They said, okay, we'll do that. But there is one other thing that we will not bend on. They said, that business of having that Bible reading at the end of this thing, that's not going to happen. You see, what Charles Schultz had done, he had added a Bible reading to the end of the show. They said, that isn't going to go on CBS Air. That's not going to happen. We don't believe that stuff. That is not us. And once again, Schultz said, well, that's kind of up to you. It's either going to run this way or it's not going to run. Now, people that were in that meeting have since reported that their feeling was that the CBS execs would have yanked the rug out of it, out from under it at that very moment, had they had anything else to go on air with, but they didn't. And besides, they promoted this Peanuts Christmas show. It was already in the trades. They didn't know what to do, so they finally decided to air it. So on December 13, a Charlie Brown Christmas came to air. 
And at the very end of the program, after Charlie had struggled through the entire program to understand the meaning of Christmas, his little buddy Linus read a passage that was heard across the country. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And that... <laughs> Go ahead, Linus, get off soon. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do... Actually, I got ahead of that, but it's off. That was the point of it. You got to see the important part. This is the way that program ended that night. Now, what happened the day after? That's the big question. Well, the day after, on December 14, when all the CBS execs arrived at work, you can bet that the tone was pretty low. They, they, they were scared. They were thinking, man, we've lost our shirts on this one. Coke is going to be paying based on audience share, and we, nobody would have been watching that thing. Well, they were stunned to walk in the office that next morning and find that, in fact, a lot of cool things had happened. Matter of fact, let me see if I can get that up. Well, you know something? I just realized I am ahead of myself in this. So forgive me for that. I'm going to get back to what happened the day after in a moment. I, I, I kind of wanted to spend a couple of minutes here, though, and talk about the reality. What would it look like had Charles Schultz not shared his art? What if he had not stood up to the executives? What if when they asked him to take that last portion of the program out, what if he had reasoned the way that I have reasoned on many occasions? And maybe you have, too. You might have said, well, you know, I'd like to have that on there. I'd like that scripture reading included. But honestly, the show is pretty good the way it is. There are some good values. I'm just going to go ahead and put it on this way. I'll agree to let CBS do their thing. Now, sometimes that's probably the best thing for us to do. I'll grant that. But on this particular occasion, Charles Schultz didn't. And that piece of his work was shared all around the country with a lot of people. Now, here's the good news. Uh, you don't always have to be in your face the way Charles Schultz was. Sometimes we are called on as Christians to be very much in the face of our culture. There are times we have to stand up and speak about right. And we have to speak about what's wrong. And we have to be very, very clear about that. Just like Charles Schultz did here. Sometimes we need to be the people of the word who bring the word to the culture in its unadulterated form. However, however... Most of the time, it doesn't work that way. Most of what God calls us to do is simply to be those individuals who bring the good news to people in very subtle but very constant ways. Um, you don't, the point is, you don't have to hit people over the head with a board. You just don't have to do that. You know, Charles Schultz, through this entire program, he never really talked about Christ until the very end. But throughout the entire program, and by the way, we could spend an hour, two hours in here this morning, we won't do that. But we could spend a lot of time talking about all of the spiritual implications that are in this little 30-minute program. I do want to share one of them with you, and this is one of the very subtle things. One of the things that most people didn't even notice the first time or two they watched the show. But many people through the decades have noticed this. Do you recall in that reading, Linus stands up to begin reading from Luke chapter 2. And of course, Linus, you recall, is the little kid that always carried his security blanket. He needed security. He always carried that blanket. And throughout all of those years, Lucy and all of the other friends had urged Linus to get rid of that stupid, as they would put it, that stupid security blanket. But he never did. 
until this one time, and to my knowledge, the only time in all 50 years, when Linus dropped his security blanket. As he read the words, fear not, Linus dropped his security blanket. And again, this was, this was a creative, subtle way that Schultz had of reminding people that with Jesus, we can be totally separated from our fears. We can, we can be set free from the bad habits that we either can or we won't let go of. And that in Jesus, we're able to drop all these false security blankets that we tend to hang on to. I mean, how many times have we done these things ourselves? I mean, we may not have a security blanket like Linus did, but how many of us trust in our wealth, or we trust in our, our, our education, or we trust in our friend, circle of friends, or maybe we just simply trust in, in the stuff that we enjoy so much? Sometimes, you know, when Jesus is sort of speaking to us, we turn the television up a little bit louder, or we go to the lake, or we do something else. See, in Jesus, we can drop all these false security blankets. And that's what Charles Schultz was trying to communicate. I want to share with you three keys this morning for reaching our culture in an effective way. Now, we're going into a new year, just a few days from now. We're going to be starting 2020, if God allows. Now, what are our plans? What are our goals as we step into this new year? I'm going to suggest that Charles Schultz exhibited three keys in what he did here that all of us need to take very seriously. First thing that Charles Schultz did, he had a set of core values. He had convictions that he was not going to equivocate from. He had principles that he stood on. A couple of things that are very important about this. Christians, if we're going to be God's kids in the right way, we need to be the people who know who we are, what we stand for, and we cannot make these decisions just based on what feels or seems right at the moment. Never wait until the moment you're under pressure to make a decision. You can't do that. You know, the time to make your decisions is when you're in the dressing room by yourself, removed from the crowd, no lights are on you, there's nobody else watching. That's when you, on your knees before God, determine what your core values are. And then that way, when you step in front of your friends and other people, you know what you stand on. You're not going to equivocate and you're not going to move away from those things. Now, there are three things that I believe are totally vital if we're going to develop core convictions the way we need to. Number one, we have to understand and we have to accept God for who he really is. With no compromise whatsoever. I love this passage, Paul talking to the Galatians. He tells us who Jesus and who God really is. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The Son is the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, things on heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and he is the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have what? Supremacy. We need to see God for who he is. He is the number one focus of everything. Now, to complement that, we also need to understand that once we understand who God is, we have to buy in unapologetically. This is not something for us to be embarrassed about. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Now, the curious thing here is that Paul talks about offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And he says that this is our foundation of worship. Now, this isn't the worship we're doing right here necessarily. I mean, yeah, we get together here on Sunday mornings for an hour or two, and we, we worship this way, and this is fine. But according to what Paul has told us elsewhere, our lives are are a sacrifice. They're a totally 24 7, 86,400 seconds every day sacrifice to God. This means that everything we do should be worship. The way we treat other people in traffic, that's a struggle for me. The way we honest question, answer questions honestly, even to our own hurt. The way we treat our children, the way we treat our husband or our wife. 
the way we open the door for other people and let them go first, the way we clean up the scrungy stuff in a public restroom that nobody else wants to clean up when nobody's watching. And not only do we have to see God for who he is and, and, and hold on to it unapologetically, but we need to hold God's word itself in high regard. Paul also tells Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, once we know what our convictions are, when we have our core values established, there's something else we have to do, and that is we have to become people of courage. We have to be the lions within our culture. And I'm not talking about lions in a negative, uh, uh, um, harsh sense. I'm talking about courageousness. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. I love Aslan, the, 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 the lion that really represents Christ. I love that representation that C.S. Lewis does in that writing. Um, we need to be the brave hearts in our cultures, folks. We need to be the people who, who really do have the courage to stand for what we believe. God implored his people throughout the scriptures, back in the Old Testament, to be people of courage. Speaking through Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous and do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And by the way, in a number of the occasions in the Old Testament where God talks to his people about courage, he's preparing the Israelites before they go into battle. And in almost every case, this little ragtag nation that did not really have a standing army, they didn't have the armament that so many of the pagan nations around them had. In most of these cases, they were going in definitely the underdogs. But God reminded them whose they were and how they needed to remain strong. Here's a passage from Deuteronomy. I love this. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. Why? For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. That's a promise. Even in the New Testament, Paul carries this same theme along a bit further. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He gives us a spirit of power to be loving people and to control our behavior. Pretty cool. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. I like this next, these next three words. Act like men. Guys, listen. Act like men. Be strong. It's high time that we have more men in this culture who act like men. And this is an admonition from Scripture. So, if we're going to reach the, the culture the way Charles Schultz did, we need to be people who have core values. We need to have the courage to communicate those core values. But more, we can't leave this last part out. So important, we also have to be willing to use our art. Charles Schultz did that. And listen carefully, every one of us in this room has an art. Several of, most of us have several arts. Some of you in this room are very capable at managing other people. Well, then do that unto God. Some of you are fabulous at selling. Sell with integrity. Those of you in here who teach, do so with love and with discipline and with a focus that counts on an eternal level. Some of you in this room are, are, are people who are making your mark right now in education. Learn, study, become the smartest people in the room. Some of you actually are skilled in some of the, of, the, of the traditional arts. Some of you play the instruments. Play those instruments to God. Some of you have great voices. Use your voices to praise God. Some of you in here can paint. Some of you may be able to sculpt. Whatever we can do, bring it before God. There's a passage that I want to share here with you that I love from Col Colossians. Paul says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. There's another passage. This one shows up back in the book of Exodus. This is in Exodus chapter 35. And again, this is when God is preparing his people to build the tabernacle. Now, as many of you know, the Israelites spent a 40-year period of their existence traveling in the wilderness. 
And God in that period did not want them to forget him. So he commanded that the Israelites build a tabernacle, which was a portable church building that they could move with them as they traveled. And God's plan for this was for it to be quite ornate. So he told Moses, Moses, rustle up as much as you can from the people. Ask the people of Israel to make free will offerings of gold and of silver, of, of, of great you know, of fabrics, anything they had that can be used in our, in our, in, in our tabernacle. And according to the Bible, people began pouring out so much, they were just overwhelmed. And at some point, there was like this big old pile of stuff that somebody had to organize and do things with. Now watch this. There's a passage here where God is going to give through Moses directions on what to do with that. And look at the high value that God places in the art of individuals. This is cool. Exodus chapter 35. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God. Now watch. In this context, the Spirit of God is about about to lead this man onto his art. He's filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all craftsmanship to make desire for working in gold and in silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood so as to perform every inventive work. He also has put in his heart to teach. He has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and in fine linen and and of the weaver as performers of every work and makers of designs. Christians, anything that you have the ability to do is a gift from God. And it's designed for two purposes, both of which glorify God. One is to find personal enjoyment in it. You really should do that. But secondly, and probably, arguably more important, it's to share it with other folk and to uplift, encourage, challenge sometimes other people that we know and that we love. This is why God gives us these abilities. And this is something Charles Schultz got. You see, your art is your gift. Whatever your art is, is designed to be given away. Um, Some of you in here have the ability to do just about anything you can dream up. As I just said a moment ago, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago now, I was thinking about rebuilding an old beat up tree house in our backyard. Now, the problem with the treehouse was it had been there a long time, and it looked horrible. Now, I could have gone out, and I could have done this job myself, and it would probably have looked about like that when I was done, okay? That is about the level of my capability right there. Now, as I was pontificating on how I was going to do this treehouse thing, I bumped into Andrew Dunaway back here, and I said, Andrew, do you know anything about building treehouses? And you said, You essentially said, yeah, and I like to do them. They're fun for me. So we talked about it. I hired Andrew, and he went to work. This is not the treehouse in the backyard. I was stuck. Now, listen, you need to understand. I was expecting something kind of like that, kind of a platform with a rail around it. I came home and walked out in the backyard, and this is what I found. Isn't that pretty amazing? Andrew still has to get the jacuzzi and the bowling alley put in, but I mean, it's, otherwise it's done. <laughs> I mean, this, this is Andrew. This is his art. This is his skill. And you know what? There are going to be some little grandkids that are going to listen to Bible stories up in that treehouse. That's what I'm talking about. Penny Waddick. Uh, Penny, are you even here this morning? I didn't, didn't see you. Where are you at? Penny and I, we were talking last week or a week or two ago, and uh, most of you know that Penny lost her husband, Marty, back in the fall. And Penny, like any woman would be doing, is rethinking her direction going forward. And we were talking the other day, and she said, you know, I have the ability to manage, and I have the ability to see how things can be done, and I have these organizational skills. Penny is starting a decluttering business. And by the way, if any of you have clutter in your home, call on this girl. She can do this. This is a gift that God has given her. And that's the cool thing. They all intersect. They all work together. They all build us up as one. So what would have happened had Charles Schultz checked his convictions, his his courage, and his art at the door? Well, this little show never would have gone to air. That's one thing. Not, Not in its present form, at least. 
Now, I started to say this a moment ago, I got ahead of myself, let me catch up at this point. What happened the next day at CBS was pretty amazing. December 14, the guys come walking in, expecting the very worst. They picked up the overnight Nielsen's and noticed that they had gotten a 45 share of the audience the night before. There had been 15 plus million, not not individuals, 15 plus million households that had watched that show the night before. This TV show went on to win a Children's Emmy Award, and this program, Christians, has run intact the way it was on the very first night, every year for 54 straight years since. It's also got a Rotten Tomatoes rating. I just checked on this the other day. It's got a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 95%. That's pretty incredible. You see, the program remains, to this day, by far one of the most popular and one of the most requested and one of the most downloaded Christmas shows of all time. And it was all because one guy chose to share his art based on his convictions. That's what it came down to. So here's our question. Are we willing to be like Charles? As we go into our new year, are we willing to make a new commitment to God? This year, God, with your help, I'm going to clarify my convictions. I'm tired of equivocating. I'm tired of kind of going this way with these people and that way with these. No, I'm going to know who I am, what I stand for, what is important in this life, and more importantly, what is important going forward. And I'm going to stand on that. And number two, am I going to have the courage to communicate this to other people in a way of love, but also in a way where I do not water anything down? And number three, am I dedicated in a greater way than I've ever done before to using whatever art, whatever gifts God has given me to make these things happen? That to me is the question. Now, we're going we're gonna to have a song here, and, and some of the shepherds are going to come up as we get ready to sing. If you have a need, whatever it is, maybe, maybe you just want somebody to pray for you. Maybe there's a sin in your life you'd like everybody to pray with you for. Uh, Maybe you don't know Jesus yet, and you'd like to learn more about coming to Christ and stepping into his way way of doing things and being baptized into this fellowship, into the fellowship of of God's church. Then this is a perfect moment for you to come. I just want to invite you to do so as we stand up, and Thomas, as you lead us in a song. In Christ alone.